Hello and welcome to the ZSL Wild Science Podcast. My name is Ellie Darby and I'm your host for this episode all about extinct in the wild species and the role that zoos and aquariums can play in saving species from the brink of extinction. But first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who emailed our new email address, wild.science at zsl.org, if you're wondering. Last episode, we were asking you if there was one thing you could change in policy or legislation to help nature recover in our cities, what would that be? One of our listeners, Gillian, said they would stop water companies pumping raw sewage into watercourses, and, if they could choose a second, it would be to put up swift bricks or boxes wherever possible on new or renovated buildings. And as a third, breaking the rules slightly, but I like the idea so we'll take it, they would encourage people to plant wildflowers that will attract pollinators and flying insects. So thank you Gillian for some brilliant ideas. There will be another question to the listeners at the end of this episode, so keep listening, and please do email us if you've got any feedback or thoughts for future episodes at wild.science at zsl.org. But for now, let's get back to the topic of this episode. The world, as we know, is facing a crisis of species extinction. However, targeted efforts in conservation biology have provided a glimmer of hope. According to the IUCN's Red List of Threatened Species, which, if you want to learn more about, you can go all the way back to episode 10 of this podcast, the most at-risk category are extinct in the wild species, existing only in zoos, aquariums, botanical gardens and seed banks. However, they are a surprisingly overlooked group, as their extinction risk is not actually assessed under the Red List process, which only concerns itself with wild populations. A new study led by ZSL and published recently in the journal Science has confirmed the incredible potential for conservation zoos, aquariums, botanical gardens and seed banks across the world to bring animals and plants back from the brink of extinction. This research is the first to comprehensively evaluate the extinct in the wild animals and plant species and hopes to shine a light on these populations to bring them the conservation efforts they desperately need. ZSL prides itself on our work in this area, currently working with 16 of the 33 classified extinct in the wild animal species, which is more than any other zoo in the UK. But none of these projects happen without a huge amount of collaboration from institutions, governments, local partners and communities around the world. We have led projects that have already successfully reintroduced several species into the wild, such as the scimitar horned oryx and Polynesian tree snails. And in this episode, we're going to find out about the exciting Extinct to the Wild projects going on right now in our zoos, science buildings and field sites, and what the future for them might hold. What challenges must be overcome and what must be done to protect the precarious future of these species. To help me find out, I'm going to be joined by four brilliant guests. Now just to note, there are an equal representation of plants as animals in the extinct in the wild species. However, we are a zoological society and although we do of course work with many plant species in lots of ways, we're primarily focusing on animals and wildlife for this episode. Plant, I promise we haven't forgotten about you, there is just too much to fit into 45 minutes, maybe 50. So enough of me talking, let's welcome our first guest. To help us understand more about this new conservation research and the science behind it, I'm joined now by Donal Smith. Donal is interested in the conservation of species that have been pushed to the brink of extinction. He spent years working in the management of threatened bird species in Mauritius and New Zealand, learning the power that direct intervention can have to recover species. He's just completed a postdoc at ZSL, researching the conservation of tiny populations, with a particular focus on species that have been driven to extinction in the wild. So he is definitely the right person to kick off this podcast. Welcome, Donal. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me on, Ellie. So can you tell me a little bit about what you do, what your research has been, and how you're involved in this new publication I mentioned at the start of this episode. So I began my work in conservation probably around 15 years ago, a little bit longer, working on the ground in conservation in in Mauritius and New Zealand. And these are places that had a lot of species that went almost to extinction, but were pulled back through really direct and, and concerted conservation interventions. This sort of provided me a lesson of how much power we had to recover species that were down in, in tiny, tiny numbers. And that sort of motivated me to have a look deeper and wider into 
to how we carried out this kind of conservation work around the world. So began to research the history of conservation projects, especially focusing on tiny populations. And it, as part of that, this weird group of species that had actually gone over the boundary of extinction, at least in the wild, but had sort of somehow hung on in places like zoos and botanic gardens, so they were solely under our care, have began to be aware of this group of species and aware of their importance and maybe how they have been maybe a little bit overlooked in how we think about and talk about extinction risk. Uh, so that's how we ended up focusing on extinct in the wild species. Amazing. I forgot to say you were the lead author on this paper, but I know it was a big collaboration with um, lots of different authors as well. But what was special about this work? Why was this study so groundbreaking? So I guess it's what makes these species special is what makes the, the work important. I think people had been aware that this category existed in a way, this idea that you could be extinct in the wild, but persisting in a place like a zoo or an aquarium or a botanic garden. But that was essentially just a designation on the IUCN Red List. So the Red List is our framework for understanding, evaluating and communicating extinction risk in all sorts of species. It gives us sort of a vocabulary to talk about how threatened the species is. So we can say something is critically endangered, something is endangered, and it gives us a way of understanding across a whole set of species how worried we should be about their future. It helps us mobilize action as well. For species that are extinct in the wild, though, all they get is the extinct in the wild designation. And this would apply whether or not you had thousands of individuals thriving in, say, zoo populations globally, or if you only had a handful and they were struggling. So we realized that here is this space, here is this group of species that were precious because they were potentially very close to extinction and they were solely dependent on us for their care, but were not really being looked at in the same way as species that would exist in the wild. So we could have a lot of species that were potentially very close to extinction, that were really, really demanding of our attention, but there was no scope in them. There was no way of us understanding how worried we should be. And so that's why, yeah, this group of international authors sort of set about trying to shine a spotlight uh, on these species that have previously not really been evaluated. Wow, that's really interesting that they designated extinct in the wild by the IUCN and then kind of forgotten about in the conservation research. But so I think this study was the first to evaluate all these species. How many, how many extinct in the wild species are there? Well, that's a good question. That's part of what we were trying to answer. So right now, as we speak, there's 84 species that are designated as extinct in the wild on the IUCN Red List. We think that some of those may be our old assessments, may no longer be valid. Some species have since gone extinct. And maybe some species actually have now information of wild populations. So we think there are 72 species, that's 33 animal species and 39 plant species of those 84 that are genuinely have that designation of extinct in the wild. But in truth, there are probably more that fit the definition. We sort of defer to the red list to confirm when a species is extinct in the wild, but that can take time. So there may be a bigger set that fit the definition that are not yet recognized as extinct in the wild. So in a way, here's the 72 we're confident about, but we, we must be aware that there may be a larger group of species that have gone extinct in the wild since, for example, the most recent assessment. Okay. And just before we go any further into this, the findings from this paper, let's just refresh everyone's GCSE or A-level biology brains with a few explanations of the science we have or will be mentioning in this episode. So we know being extinct isn't good, of course, but what's the problem with small populations? or tiny populations that you're an expert in, how small can a population be to survive if given the right circumstances? On a really simple level, having fewer of something is probably more precarious than having more of something, right? Intuitively, that makes sense. So small populations are more in threat for a lot of intuitively obvious reasons. They are at greater risk of just some random catastrophe eliminating them entirely. You know, let's say a single storm, if it's a wild population, but if it's, for example, a zoo population or a botanic garden population, maybe a single catastrophe, a single disease outbreak, all these random 
bad things that might happen. If you've got a tiny population, it's more likely to blink out in response to some unanticipated catastrophe. It's also more subject to just random variation affecting it. So for example, just by pure chance, if you have nine males and a single female in a single breeding generation, then suddenly you actually have a much smaller effective population size the following generation. So this random chance affects you more the smaller the population is. You also have genetic risks that are associated with small populations. If you have very large populations, random variation in gene frequency is low. But if tiny populations, just by pure chance, some genes can go out of existence. Small populations are just more exposed to a lot of random chance related uh, risks, also more at risk of inbreeding. So you're much more likely to be in a circumstance where closely related individuals end up mating with each other. And this brings loads of risk and inbreeding depression. So the smaller you go, the higher the risk is. And there's no real clear definition of how low is impossibly low. I mean, fewer than two is. But there are some thresholds that people will often speak about if you want to be confident about the long term sustainability of, for example, a zoo population. There are some rules of thumb out there. Now, we must be very cautious about rules of thumb because really what you should do is is model how large a population should be for that given species, its ecology, its life history, and the management circumstances that it's under. But broadly speaking, when people make these calculations, if you want to be comfortable about the long-term sustainability of your population, you probably want a population somewhere in the thousands. If you're down in the hundreds, maybe you should start being worried. If you're down in the tens and there's no possibility of supplementation from elsewhere, then you're kind of in a dangerous space. So there's no defined threshold, but the lower you go, the more worried and more concerned you should be about those effects, about genetic drift and all these things beginning to affect the long-term sustainability of your population. That was a great explanation and that makes a lot more sense to me now. So it leads on to kind of what data you were looking at for each species and I'm wondering from what you just said are most of these extinct in the wild species that are just in zoos, aquaria and, and seed banks, are they under the thousands? They're in the hundreds or the tens even? Most populations are down in the hundreds or lower of extinct in the wild animal species. So they are much lower than general population genetic advice suggests that populations should be to be sustainable. And that's a worry. It's a bit of a clarion call. And that's for loads of understandable reasons, right? Ex situ institutions, so zoos, botanic gardens, aquariums, they have limited space and limited resource. And what data were you looking at other than just number for each of these species? We looked at a, a few key elements that we think are probably important to how reassured we should be about these populations. And the first thing is how many individuals were they founded on in the first place? The general advice out there is that you'd want to found, for example, a zoo population population use as your beginning at least 30 to 50 individuals, probably more. But often these species were taken from already declining or quite small wild populations. And we found that for the most part, where we were able to find the information, and quite strikingly, you often, there, it's lost to history, how many individuals are taken in the first place. But where we do know, most of these populations were founded on, on fewer than 30 individuals. Some of them are in the teens. So they're already a little bit in trouble to start with. There's a small gene pool to, to work from, a much smaller subselection than whatever the wild population would have been, certainly prior to declines. So we're already in a bit of a tricky space. And when you're in that tricky space, you want to grow. You want to have large populations to preserve the variation that you have captured, even though that's low, and to insulate against all those risks we talked about with small populations. So we looked at how many individuals are captured. And then, yeah, how large are they now? We want them to be large, especially if we captured a small amount. We also don't want to hold all our eggs in a small number of baskets. So we also looked at how many separate individual institutions, zoos and botanic gardens and seed banks or aquariums, were holding each species. So is each species just held at one or two institutions or are they well spread globally? 
we also had a sort of an overview of the history of this space. How have species tended to fare in this weird space of being solely in their human care? Is it kind of like a dead end or do we actually work towards recovery? Are they connected with their wild habitats? Do people try and release them back? Do they try and recover these species? So we looked at the history of conservation towards recovery in the wild for all these species and for species that have been in this space since 1950. So we tried to get a finger on the pulse of the species right now, but also how well species in the space have progressed historically and are currently progressing towards recovery in the wild, which ultimately we hope would be the objective if they are to be conservation oriented collections. Okay, so that's a lot of data that you were collecting there and analysing. And I would recommend, if anyone can, to read the paper to fully understand this. But just sort of in a nutshell for the purpose of this podcast, what were the key findings? The key findings were, well, firstly, that extinct and wild species are in a really tricky space. A lot of them are held at numbers that are far lower than we should be comfortable about. A lot of them have been held for many generations or for a long period of time in ex situ care. And over time, that renders them possibly less and less suitable for release in the wild. A lot of them were founded by a small number of individuals. So all these things mean, broadly speaking, many extinct of the wild species are in a precarious space and there's a sense of urgency. The longer it goes on, the worse the problem will get. One of the other key findings, and one that maybe I was a little bit surprised and encouraged by, was that in animals, at least, there has been actually quite a lot of activity in trying to return these species to the wild. Historically and and at, at present, the majority of animal species that have found themselves restricted to human care have been subject to attempts to return them to the wild. And some of these have retained wild status or have regained wild status, rather. So we have actual thriving, in some cases, wild populations of species that have once been entirely eliminated from the wild. So maybe that's the encouraging side of things. We have a bit of an emergency when it comes to species that are extinct in the wild, but we know that there is a pathway towards recovery. We know we've already made this transition for a whole set of species. So, well, we know that we have restored 12 species back to entirely wild status. So that's 10 animals and two plants uh, that were once extinct in the wild. The flip side to that is that we've lost 11 to extinction. So we know that failure, that extinction is a danger here, but we also know that restoration is a possibility. And I think that's maybe the one of the key messages. Amazing. I'm so glad you said some positive news because I was getting really depressed on this side. But I mean, it is an emergency, as you say, and hopefully people can learn from those failures, from those species that we've lost. What impact do you hope that this study could have on extinct in the wild species? Will it highlight the importance of actively intervening in species recovery before it's too late? Yeah, the key thing I would hope that this piece of work does is is we achieve a bit of a transformational change in how we view these species and consequently we act. Ultimately, I would love to see more species being recovered to the wild uh, that are currently restricted to ex situ care. But also, yeah, as you say, we begin to use this tool even more strategically, the tool we have of being able to care for species in places like botanic gardens, seed banks and zoos and aquariums. We begin to recognize its power. It's not going to work in all situations, but we we deploy it for the species that need it most and for the species that are currently under our care. We appreciate how important they are and how potentially precarious their situation is and enable action towards that recovery. I think this space, this science is in its infancy. We're likely to be needing to use this tool for the decades to come. And hopefully we can get better and better at it. And if this piece of work helps build a platform for action in this area that has maybe in some cases been a little bit neglected, then I think that would be really, really positive. That's brilliant. And hopefully this podcast can <laughs> help share some of that information. Thank you so much for explaining all those the complex science behind this work as well. Yeah, I hope so too. So now that we've found out all about extinct in the wild species and the importance of zoos, aquaria and seed banks for their survival, let's hear a little more about ZSL's work in this area. To help me find out, I'm joined now by Dr John Ewan, a senior research fellow here in ZSL's Institute of Zoology. Hi John, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Nice to be here, thanks Ellie for inviting me. So tell me about what you do at ZSL. 
me, well, most of my work at ZSL focuses on the recovery of small populations, often using some form of conservation translocation, like a, a reintroduction or a reinforcement. So, I mean, for example, with the, with the sea heck, so the Guam Kingfisher, I've been heavily involved with that since 2020, and I currently chair the sea heck recovery team for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. At a more overarching level, I'm part of a global IUCN task force for extinct in the wild species. And so we've been working to raise the profile of these species and secure commitment from governments and from conservation NGOs globally to act together for wild recovery. And I think it's because of this and this experience that I've been lucky enough to help develop and now lead on ZSL's new Extinct in the Wild conservation program for the recovery of these species. Okay, so this is a new thing being brought in, what, this year? Is this, is this brand new? You're working on it? It is. It probably kicked off in all reality early last year, but it's been a slow gestation to get it to come together. Brilliant. And it's, is it across different teams in ZSL? Of course, it's society-wide. So we work closely from within some science and through conservation and policy and also the collections and the curatorial teams. Awesome. So it's a really collaborative sort of cross-directorate working. That's what we like to hear. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, It's needed. If we're going to be successful in this way, we're going to have to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Bringing in the expertise from everywhere. So just to focus in a little bit on your experience, what kind of extinct in the wild initiatives have you been involved in? But also just sort of wider than that, what's your work generally been involved in at ZSL? How long have you been there? Just tell me a bit about your history there. Uh, Well, I've been at ZSL since 2004. So closing in on 20 years now, which is pretty scary, Um, but also, you know, what an amazing place to have the privilege of working for. And, you know, again, throughout that time, most of my work has been focused on on small population recovery, lots of reintroductions, reinforcements of bird populations in New Zealand and Mauritius also working on reptiles and and mammal species in different countries around the world. So you mentioned just then reinforcements. How is that different from some of this um, extinct in the wild rescue and recovery? It's a part of it, actually. So when it comes to what we're trying to achieve with our work with extinct in the wild species, um, what we're really trying to do is bend the fortunes of these species away from extinction. And to do that, we're working across four broad focal areas. You've just mentioned rescue. So we do want to be able to identify those species which are on the very brink of extinction, where if we do not rescue them, we will lose them forever. We also then need to be very careful with the species extinct in the wild species we have in our care that we ensure that they do not go extinct on our watch. So we need to revitalize those captive populations. Ultimately, of course, we want to return these extinct in the wild species to free living wild populations. So we need to release individuals back into wild environments. And then once we've done that, the job's not finished. We need to reinforce those populations. That could be with further releases to support that establishing population and other types of management that we can provide them to ensure that those newly wild populations thrive. So... I mean, each of these processes that you've just talked about must be so unique to different species because I'm guessing they face different threats depending on where they came from, what they were facing when their populations were struggling. So what are all the considerations that you have to take into account when deciding what course of action to take? How do you focus your conservation efforts It's very true that, you know, these species all end up in a very similar situation, which requires us to to rescue them, bring them into captivity to prevent extinction. But how each of those species got to that situation is unique. And also that then our ability to provide appropriate care in captivity and how that captive care might work and how we might go about releasing them back into the wild is unique to every one of these species. And so we have to be very careful uh, in the decision making around it. And so a whole bunch of factors weave together. We've got ethical considerations, welfare considerations, social and cultural acceptability, cost. All of these things are critically important. We need to weave them together to make the best possible decisions. So really, I mean, it's not simply about biology that determines what we do. And if we ignore all of these other critically important values, we do so at our and at those species peril. And who's making those decisions? Again, it will depend on the situation. Some of these species which might still be existing in the wild on the brink of extinction, we need to work with local partners, local governments, local people to understand whether and how we should be bringing them in. We need to be working with the zoological 
tribal or botanical communities to understand whether we can and whether we can successfully hold them in captivity. And we need to work with a whole range of conservation NGOs and public, local and more broadly to understand the best way that we can recover wild populations. We also need to work with finances and governments to ensure that we've got the endorsement and the resource to be able to undertake this. Yeah, because I guess none of this can happen without funding. Absolutely not, yeah. (laughs) And I suppose ZSL's in a unique position itself, being that it's two conservation zoos with scientists and conservationists who also work on the ground in various countries around the world. So we sort of have these teams that could bring, you know, one of these projects together at least and actually house some of the animals themselves. Absolutely. I think, I mean, ZSL is unique in the way you describe that we've got these two amazing zoos. Our zoos hold about half of the extinct in the wild animal species. We've got our science department and we've got our field conservation department as well. We've got great fundraising teams and education and outreach teams. So as a society, we've got a very powerful role to play. But I think really importantly, we need to acknowledge that we cannot do this alone. We will never be working in isolation and that every one of these species is linked to a a local community, a local country, a local government, and also uh, in-country partners that will be absolutely essential to be able to successfully recover. Yeah, a lot of stakeholder collaboration and yeah, working with all different teams in all different kinds of ways, I bet. I mean, it's exciting right that's how it should be no one person should be trying or no one organization should be trying to do it alone it doesn't make sense you know we should be in this together actually we are encouraging more institutions to hold these extinct in the wild species so in many cases extinct in the wild species are held at very small number of institutions and that in itself adds risk we've just been through a covid pandemic for example and zoos and botanic gardens and aquariums have financially struggled if they are the sole holders of a species and they're lost, that would be a disaster. Yeah, so you can do everything possible to try and save the species, but if the zoo itself can't actually sustain it, then that's that's a big problem as well. Exactly. Like If the zoo can't sustain it or if there is a, an accidental disease outbreak in a collection in a zoo, if it's the only institution that holds them, then the species is lost. So we do need to spread our eggs across more than one basket. Definitely. So as we said, you're part of ZSL's sort of Extinct in the Wild initiative. Are you allowed to say what's the next species or projects that you're working on? What can we be looking forward to hearing about next? Um, Yeah, well, I think 2023 is shaping up to be super exciting. For example, we're hoping to have our first releases of CHEC, the Guam Kingfisher, in around mid-year, pending final permit approvals and financing. And this will be the first attempts at releasing CHEC back into the wild since they were rescued in the 1980s. Uh, So I think that's the first big exciting thing that ZSL is going to be involved with. Following on from that, we're hoping to move some Mexican fish back to Mexico as soon as possible. And I think Alex will probably talk with you a little bit more about that move. And we've also just been down in Mexico and working with in-country partners, looking at returning or reintroducing Socorro Dove back onto Socorro Island in Mexico. Gosh, that's really exciting. What a big year for for this project. So just to wrap up, please tell me, what's your favourite extinct in the wild species? These species need some light to be shone on them. They need some attention. They need to be brought up in the conservation, global, financial world a bit. Oh, honestly, Ellie. I think that's an unfair question. I can't answer it. I think that they're all absolutely amazing species. They've got fascinating stories, they're tragic stories, but they're also really hopeful stories. And every one of them is different. And so I I would hate to have to try and pick one above any other one. Oh, well, it's been great chatting to you today, John. Thank you very much. No, thank you for your time, Elliot. It's a pleasure. Species Spotlight. This is a relatively new segment where I cram in facts about a certain species for one minute to shine a little conservation spotlight on them. This time, I'm going to be telling you all about Parchula snails. Parchula snails are actually a group of species, so I'm bending the rules a little bit, but it's a really exciting conservation success story. 
These animals are found in the Polynesian islands and are a huge part of the local culture, with each species representing the cultural identity of each island. So when many species were wiped out by the carnivorous rosy wolf snail, which was introduced to control a different non-native snail species, it had disastrous consequences for the Parchula snails. ZSL led a team to save the last nine individuals of one species in 1991, and after over 30 years of careful breeding, this species has now successfully been returned to the wild. Together with the international zoo community, ZSL has reintroduced over 15,000 snails back into the wild, of 11 previously extinct in the wild species, and we continue to actively breed, release and monitor these snails on four islands in Polynesia. You can find out more about this work on our website, zsl.org. And that's it. Hopefully we've understood about some of the wider ambitions and the science behind the Extinct in the Wild initiatives. Now, we're going to find out a little bit more about the practicalities of being involved in one of these projects. I'm joined now by Alex Cliff, Ectotherm Team Leader at ZSL Whipsnade Zoo. Thank you for talking to me today, Alex. Can you tell me a bit more about your job? What do you do? I'm the team leader of ectotherms at ZSL Whipsnade Zoo, and I oversee the fish, reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates. We have a large variety of species here at Whipsnade Zoo, and our focus is looking at some of the extinct of the wild species uh, of fish in our collection. Brilliant. And how long have you been working at ZSL? I've been working at ZSL for 20 years. The first 12 years was at ZSL London Zoo, uh, helping oversee the aquarium, which is now closed. And then I've been at Whipsnade Zoo for eight years. And the priority was to relocate the threatened freshwater fish up to Whipsnade. And we have a wide variety of species. We have 26 species of threatened freshwater fish. And within that, we have five extinct of the wild species, three of which are a priority at the moment in Mexico. So just staying on that kind of extinct in the wild theme, that's what we're talking about in this episode. What are some of the considerations that you need to take into account once you've rescued a remaining population from the wild? if that's the plan of action for that species. You have to make sure that the populations are stable. With the species in question, they are extremely delicate. They need a lot of care of an, and attention. And since the IOCN status is extinct to the wild, there is a, a duty for us at ZSL to maintain these species in the best conditions possible, but also to ensure there is good representation in other institutions, which falls under the umbrella of the EEP coordinator to do that role. I am the pupfish and killifish coordinator for uh, Europe, and it's my duty to ensure that we get good representation due to the fragility of these species. Earlier, you mentioned the the three extinct in the wild species. Are they all pupfish species? Yes, that's correct. We have three pupfish species, which are found in the northeast regions of Mexico, and uh, they have been extinct for around 20 years now in the wild due to anthropogenic pressures like water abstraction. So these species are found in very, very small springs. The water is now gone. Uh, and that's why it's our duty within zoos and aquariums to try and stabilise and manage these populations. Amazing. Wow. So that's a really long term programme already, if they've been extinct in the wild for 20 years. Yeah, that's correct. But now we're looking at driving a good representation throughout the collections, but also we're looking at opportunities to reintroduce these fish back into Mexico in two mindsets. One is looking at representation within Mexican institutions, within in zoos and aquariums, which is an extension of the EEP program, but also looking at the opportunities to investigate the wild habitats again to see if there's any feasibility of uh, rejuvenating or reintroducing these species back into the wild habitats. Yeah, so that was one thing I was wondering before, again, when these populations are originally rescued, are they cared for in one place or are they sort of split across several institutions? At the moment, there are only literally a handful of institutions in the world that have these three species. And of those handful, only three institutions have robust populations, one of which is ZSL Whipsnade Zoo, which has which has the largest collection in the world. We also have colleagues in Vienna Zoo in Austria who have put fish there, and also colleagues in San Antonio Zoo in Texas. And we're going to work together on trying to bolster these populations into good, robust numbers. But the representation is so, so limited, hence why the drive 
drive to prioritise these three species. And so when you're mentioning robust populations, can you just tell me what you mean by that? It's a very good question because with fish, it's very hard to ascertain what a robust population is. But what we try and aim for within institutions is around 200 individuals per institution. It might not be achievable because of the constraints of staffing or the size of the aquariums that they've got available, but that's what we try and aim for is around 200 per institution. Okay, great. How do the breeding programs work? Is there a centralised system for this? Yeah, we use uh, ZIMS, which is the Zoological Information Management System, which is a software-based program that hundreds and hundreds of zoos and aquariums around the world use. And this is a database that everyone can access within the ZIMS profile. And what that will give EP coordinators the opportunity to look at the representation and the numbers of species within institutions. And then from there, you can start looking at how you can distribute them within other institutions to increase the representation. That's kind of like social media for animals in the zoo. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, I think the technology has advanced so much now that it's removing the paper trail of you know sending letters or in the past when they used to manage programs many, many years ago. But the software and the technology is there for EP coordinators to make decisions within the duty to make sure that there is an increased representation of these species. Brilliant. So just going back to the pupfish, the project that you've been involved with, what happened to their habitats? Why are they extinct? in the wild in the first place. These pupfish are endemic to certain springs in northeast Mexico, and the main pressure or the plight of those habitats was down to water abstraction by humans. So the the areas that they're from are desert regions, so water is extremely scarce. And obviously, humans have prioritised irrigating the land and using water for other purposes. So the main concern was, was water abstraction. And so if you're thinking now about reintroductions for these species... Is their habitat still there or do you reintroduce them to different places or how does the reintroduction side of it work? It's a great question and it's it's one of the things that we need to investigate. That is t- into twofold. We need to go back to Mexico, uh, to the wild habitats. We know where they are and we need to assess the current status of those springs to see if there's any possibility of looking at the agricultural elements that might be there, the groundwater availability. If they are deemed unsuitable for whatever reason, there are options to look at other sites called assisted migration, which we will be looking at as an opportunity. But that is one of the uh, objectives in the next phase of this project is to investigate the viability of the wild habitats for reintroduction. And you've just come back from a trip to Mexico. What were you doing there? Were you meeting with partner institutions or it must be a big collaborative project? Yeah, it was really exciting. You know, we've been looking after these fish for decades and uh, ZSL has been driving the Extinct of the Wild Species Initiative, and one of which was the pupfish that came up as, as, as a driver. And we started to network with institutions in Mexico, so zoos and aquariums, to look at the viability of using them as institutions to hold the pupfish for the first time in history. So we wanted to, first of all, get that rapport and relationship with the um, zoos and aquariums to make sure that we can get them back back into captive population capacities. And we went to four institutions uh, in Mexico and really positive meetings, really engaging. And now we can now look at the summary of that report and then look at what institutions can facilitate these fish in different capacities. Some zoos had good outdoor and indoor facilities to house these fish. Some of them could provide funding or assist us with the inspections of their wild habitats. So each institution can provide a different opportunity to drive this program. And not only that, we actually went to Morelia, which is a small town between Guadalajara and Mexico City, where a colleague called Omar Dominguez has already successfully reintroduced two freshwater Mexican species back into the wild. So we're using Omar skills and experience and guidance to really drive this because he has facilities in his uh, lab in the university in Morelia to uh, support these species on a large scale for reintroduction. That's fantastic. I hope it goes well. What's the next phase then? 
we've actually started the next phase. As soon as I got back, we started meetings with looking at the genetics of our pupfish because, as I mentioned, that they are extremely limited. The wild range is extremely limited. They're endemic to one spring. So w- what we need to do as part of the EEP role is to look at the genetic variation between the populations within institutions, but also to look if there's any genetic material that has been lost over the breeding over the last 10, 20 years. And then that'll be down to me to make a decision with colleagues to look at increasing or stabilizing populations depending on the representation from a genetic perspective. And then from there, we can start selecting institutions for moving these fish back into Mexico. Oh, wow. Well, that sounds like incredible work. What's your favorite of all of the fish species that you work with? It's a good question. I think it does change. But I think having my EEP hat on and managing these fish for 20 years at Zerdacel, it's my reaction to what's going on in the wild is my favourite animal. So if there's a species of fish that I can help make a difference with to get them back in the wild, that's right at the top of my priorities and my, my wish list. And that's the great thing about Zerdacel. We've got this opportunity to, to drive collections in our zoos to really get these fish back into the wild for the first time in history. So the answer is the pupfish at the moment, because we can make a difference. We can get these back into the wild in in some capacity. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for speaking to us today. My pleasure. Thank you. So now we've learned about what happens to extinct in the wild species when they're being cared for in zoos and aquaria. We're going to find out what happens next with the release and reintroduction stage. I'm joined now by Melanie Mesa Blas. Mel works for the Department of Education in Guam, where she's joining us from today. She is a science teacher and also holds a National Geographic Explorers Grant supported by ZSL and works with ZSL through the CHEC or Guam Kingfisher Conservation Project. Thanks so much for joining me today, Mel. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you do day to day? I'm a high school science teacher. I teach marine biology, so I teach about the ocean with a heavy emphasis on conservation and sustainability. Amazing. And you you live in Guam, yes? Yes. How long have you lived there? I've actually lived on Guam for over 20 years. It must be a beautiful place to live. Oh, yes, it's beautiful. And so how are you involved with ZSL's Extinct in the Wild species work? I was a part of the SEEC conservation project. I was an education community representative. And when ZSL was was part of the World Expo, I was honored by being invited to be a part of the um, World Wildlife Day and to speak and share the story about our SEEC. Oh, brilliant. So how long has that project been going on now? I've been a part of the CHEC program since 2019. And I think that you're part of something called, or you're the director of, the Guardians of the Kingfisher Project. Is that true? Yes and no. It's not a formal name for Guardians of the Kingfisher Project. Basically, um, we, we wanted to start a movement to try to get more people to know, especially on Guam, get more people to know about what the what's going on with our CHEC because um, it seems that more people that don't live on Guam know more about our bird than the people who actually live on Guam because the bird's been off Guam for over 30 years. I mean, the bird has not been in the wild for over 30 years. So we've lost a little bit of a connection between the community and our bird. We reconnected with another bird that's also extinct in the wild on Guam that we've been successfully able to introduce into other places, not Guam. Yeah, and that's our cocoa bird. People have connected with that bird but we haven't really connected with the sea heck as much because the cocoa bird you can hold in your hand and it doesn't fly away. Yeah, they can see it and it's more tangible. So tell me more about the sea heck. What happened to it? Why is it extinct in the wild in the first place? Uh, unfortunately, um, we had a lot of native birds, a lot of endemic birds on Guam. But after World War II, um, there was an introduction of the brown tree snake, which is an invasive species and Our birds weren't used to having a predator, a very good, efficient, nocturnal predator that took out a lot of our birds and endangered a lot of our birds and made them extinct in the wild. We only started noticing it in the 80s. And so before that, was the sea heck a bird that was known by people who live in Guam? Was it abundant? Were they everywhere? Yes, uh, the sea heck was one of the birds that people noticed, people heard, people saw people ate. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, you live on an island, you consume natural resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were rescued from the wild. 
the sea heck and bred in captivity and they're now at a point where they're ready potentially for for releasing back into the wild but is it safe for them to be released into their native habitat on Guam at the moment? No sadly there it's not safe on Guam yet because we haven't been able to control the brown tree snake population and we would never want to release them back and then they're all gone from the world forever so that's why we have to look at other places. What sort of other places are you looking at? We were trying originally we were trying to stay closer. We were trying to release the bird on Isla Dano, which is also known as Cocos Island, which is not very far from Guam. It's still a part of Guam, but it's off the island of Guam. And for the longest time it was free of brown tree snakes. And that's where we released our cocoa birds, our Guam rails, and they've been able to thrive there. Um, but recently, right when we were about to start releasing them, then we discovered that there is evidence of brown tree snakes there. So we can't take that chance right now. Oh, wow. And the brown tree snakes don't predate too much on the cocoa bird on that island? I don't know the update on that right now, because right now it's being studied by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and by USDA, I believe. So there's personally, I think that they should just try to eradicate all the brown tree snakes now. So that island is maybe a no-go for the sea hex. So is there another um, place that you're looking at? Yes. Yeah, so right now we are we're looking at releasing our sea hex in the wild in a very, very distant island called Palmyra Atoll. It is very, very far. It is very, very expensive to get there because it's so remote. But on the positive side of releasing the, the bird there, there's no human communities there. It's a experimental station. And so it's, it doesn't interfere with people's culture, with people's lifestyle, with people's lives. Well, that kind of leads on to my next question, which was what kind of considerations do you need to take into account before releasing a population of a species into an area? And one of those I was thinking would be cultural, but I guess if there's no communities living on that island, that isn't such a consideration there. Yeah, so right now I believe it's just um, scientists that go there for periodic times to do studies there. A lot of things we had to consider with Palmyra was whether or not there was a competing kingfisher so that we wouldn't be interfering with that habitat. Um, also with diseases on the populations that we're bringing in and then also whether or not there'd be enough food for our kingfisher there and whether, you know, just they had to look into a lot of things. But luckily we didn't have to look into interfering with people, communities out there. Yeah, but if it were somewhere that people were living, you would need to kind of involve the community in that area. And I, I'm guessing this kind of work involves a lot of collaboration between institutions, governments, local communities, zoos, researchers. So in any of the work you've done, how do you work with like local communities, for example? For the CHEC and our conservation translocation meetings, because we have been investigating, you know, on the potential for releasing them on various islands that are closer to Guam and talking to community members, to scientists, to conservationists, to, to people, representatives from different islands, as well as government agencies and nonprofits. And, and, and even with working with Palmyra, that even though there's not a, a local community there, we still are working with zoos from all, because the, the zoos are the ones, in addition to um, Guam to Harp Agriculture and Guam, the zoos around the United States are housing and helping breed our sea heads. And so they are ready to help us repopulate because we don't want the birds to just disappear from the world forever. We want them to fly free. And we want them to take that next step and fly in the sky. And it sounds like that next step is maybe possible. We're on the right track for it to be possible. And I believe just kind of around your own like teaching work as well, you try to get your students that you teach involved in learning more about protecting the environment. How do you do this? And how important do you think this is for children growing up in Guam? Oh, I think this is very important. I, I, I'm, I'm the kind of teacher that doesn't just like kids to read about articles and what other people are doing. I want them to get actively engaged with being a part of the solution, with helping figure out possible solutions, but also taking part. So my kids go out to the mountains and we plant trees. We teach third graders about how to protect corals. We go into elementary schools and we teach them. Before the pandemic, we used to 
have an ocean fair, a traveling science, traveling ocean fair, where we would visit various schools and have all these hands-on exhibits for the kids to interact with and play games. Because we don't, we don't have like a science museum on Guam. So I wanted to be a part of Solution and also have my kids involved. So they would, we would set it up at a school and then the kids would come and visit. And every time we do it, like schools are like, are you going to come again? Can you come again tomorrow? And so we said, no, we'll come here next year. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And you're making your own science museum with all the incredible nature that you're probably surrounded by as well. Um, yeah, my students also participate in like campus cleanups and beach cleanups. And we also practice the six R's. So we don't just read about it and read about what other people are doing. I mean, there's just a lot of things that I want the kids to practice doing right now they're being role models to the the rest of the school because we we showcase what we do and it's also on a website so we try to encourage other people to also do it you know like, it doesn't matter how old you are it doesn't matter that you don't have a lot of money that there are a lot of things that you can do right from your house to protect our ocean to protect our environment that sounds incredible and that's definitely something we try to encourage in, at ZSL as well is that the small steps that each person can take that can make a difference but yeah the fact that the kids are learning that from a really young age is is awesome and then also being role models for even younger kids they're already becoming kind of environment ambassadors which is really cool <laughs> oh well thank you so much thank you So just one more question that I'm asking all the speakers in the podcast. What, in your opinion, is the most important thing needed now to save these species on the brink of extinction? It might be a bit of a fluffy answer in a way, but I think it's to appreciate, to realise the importance of this space. I think some species have maybe drifted to extinction from this space because we didn't fully grasp how precious they were, that we were holding the last individuals of an entire species, or we realised that too late. If we can transform how we think about it, then I think that's the key change, because that will enable resource, attention, people to actually carry out the really important work of hopefully restoring these species to the wild. So I think the first step is appreciation of importance, prioritization, understanding that these species are really special. Well, I think for people listening to this, I would encourage them to come and visit one of ZSL zoos or a zoo closer to where they might be living and ask to see their extinct in the wild species if they've got them and ask what is being done to ensure that these species are on the journey to recovery and not slipping to extinction. So learn about their stories and see how you might be able to get involved. We need, you know, reasoned and bold action to achieve recovery. We need public support. We need financial assistance, technical expertise and government endorsement to do this. And I think, you know, these species fates are absolutely in our hands and it is up to us collectively to achieve recovery. And it's something I believe that we can do. To save these species from the brink of extinction is we need consistency and continuity in our duties. With pupfish, they are extremely scarce in the representation. They are extinct in the wild. So we need to make sure that there is a long-term plan that ZSL is committed to so we can deliver this back into the wild as, as an initiative within ZSL. I think perseverance, to not give up and keep doing everything that we can and just keep trying different things because one of them is going to work. <laughs> So four very inspiring answers there, and I feel like they really summarise this episode's topic incredibly well. But now we want to hear from you. Please email wild.science at zsl.org with your thoughts on the one thing these extinct in the wild species need to not just survive, but thrive for generations to come. You can also get in touch if you've got any topics for future episodes that you'd like to hear, or feedback, as we are always trying to improve. And while you're on your phone or computer, please remember to rate and review the podcast as it means a lot and helps boost us in the charts. I'm very sad to announce that this will actually be my last episode. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for your continued support. It's been so much fun doing these. And if you can do one thing for me as a parting gift, please share the podcast with someone who you think might enjoy it. There will be more episodes. So if I were you, I would subscribe on your favourite podcast app to make sure you don't miss them. But for now, thank you to our wonderful guests and thank you all for listening.